Good evening. How are we doing tonight, man? Cool. All right. Um, you probably got all the announcements about other things. And one thing I want to reiterate on a little bit is the business meeting tomorrow at 4 o'clock. Try to make that if you can. Um, it's my honor to introduce the next speaker. And I'm going to start from present. We're going to work backward a little bit, talk about this young man. Um, he's probably did okay at, the, at Madison. Coach Chris said, spoke highly of him. Um, then he, he spent a couple years in the NFL. Probably did okay there. And then he went back to the Badgers and walked on. Did pretty good there. Uh, he won the slam dunk contest as his freshman and a sophomore. And when a 5'8", 5'9", guy, a white guy, wins the slam, huh? 5'10", excuse me, I, I screwed him by an inch, that's not good, okay? Wins the slam dunk, dunk, slam dunk contest twice, they don't have it anymore. So he, he was a two-time champ there. But the first time I saw him and was told about him, I was coaching a small high school up in northern Wisconsin, and his team was playing up in another town. This is back when we had the teachers' conventions and all that stuff. Okay, so we played on a Wednesday, and they were playing on a Friday. So I go up to Turtle Lake, and he's not playing. Oh, shit, I drove all the way to Turtle Lake to watch this guy play. Heard a whole bunch about him. He's not on the field. Coach Gago knew what he was doing. Okay, and uh, so they're down eight zip at halftime. So Turtle Lake kicks off to Flambeau. They get the ball at 35 yard line after kickoff. One play, touchdown. Two point, two point conversion, boom, tied up 8 8. So then they go back, get the ball back. Three and out, punt. Next play, about a 70 yard touchdown, boom. Go ahead, get two point conversion. Ahead 16 to 8. Game over. He was a sophomore. Okay, so. He's probably did okay from a, a kid that was Tony Wisconsin at that time, the pride of Tony, pride of the NFL, and now the pride of Wisconsin. Coach Jim Leonard, thank you. All right, guys, good evening. Can you all hear me in the back? We need to work sound, good. Um, honored to be here, guys. I'll try to stay out of the way of that. Um, honored to be here. Um, very first clinic of this size. Done some mini clinics and things like that. Really love teaching on a small group basis, so this is gonna be fun. I'll probably be a little bit more interactive than Coach Rudolph. He talked for an hour and 18 minutes and then asked for questions for about a minute and a half. So I'll try to kick it back and forth to you guys a little bit more. Um, Want to talk a little life, a little philosophy. Obviously, I'm new to coaching, right? Only been in this for a couple years. So just want to get across to you guys a little bit of what I believe in, what I've picked up over the years, kind of core principles, all that type of stuff. How I think you got to treat players as I've been a player a hell of a lot longer than a coach. So want to get to that and then kick over and very similar to Coach Rudolph, really hit on a little bit of skill progression. That carries over for you guys. Some skills, some drills. Going to focus on off coverage because it applies, whether it's corners, whether it's safeties, you're going to play some sort of off coverage, kind of give you some key buzzwords on the positions that I ask my guys to get there, and then some of the best ways that I feel like you can get there. Um, so that's mainly what I get to get to. And if, if we have time at the end, we'll get into a little bit of press that way. Stick into the DB world. So if you don't want to hear about that, about halfway through this thing, you can just go grab a beer. You'll be OK. But like I said, talk a little bit of life first. You know, a lot of you guys, I've, I know these high school coaches in the state, I know you only came down to Madison to make some bad decisions tonight. So I'm on that philosophy. We just got to save one. Just got to save one guy. So have fun, enjoy it, and take something away from us, please. But was very fortunate to play this game and be around a ton of great coaches really since the beginning. High school coach Darryl Gago was a great coach. Come to Wisconsin and play for Barry Alvarez, great coach. Go to the NFL, 
you know, a little bit of the beauty of playing at a lot of places, you are around a lot of different coaches and philosophies and styles. And you just really get to see who you want to be. I kind of always knew I may end up down this path. Family full of coaches, not all football coaches, but a family full of coaches. So I always took a lot of pride in, in learning and being that visual learner and seeing what was going on around me. So I want to share a little bit of that with you and kind of what made me who I am as a coach. And then, like I said, we'll get into the football side. But number one for me, and the beauty is a lot of you guys are teachers, but having that mindset that coaching is teaching, right? You have to have a competitive spirit about you, otherwise you wouldn't be in this game. But really the core of everything to me goes back to being a great teacher and being a great communicator. You can't have the philosophy that kids are trying to make mistakes, right? Kids are trying to do what you want them to do. Some of them just have no clue how to do it. Maybe it's the urgency. They don't know how important things are. They don't know why, right? I, I think why is a very important question. I'll hit that on, on that a lot. But to me, it's just taking that teaching mindset as far as if you can't get your players to do what you're asking them to do, you really just got to spend a lot of time on figuring out how can you do that. You're throwing buzzwords out there that have worked for years. Maybe you just got to tweak it a little bit. You got to get out of your comfort zone and find a way. We got a DB we're talking about, you got to drop your hips, got to drop your hips. Didn't click to him. Because I talked to this corner, he just said, I got to sink. Come on now, like how easy is that? But you got to get out of kind of what you've always done, right? And just always being a teacher. And you might have to do it different every year because of the different group that you have. I always like to take things down to kind of the base elements. How do we make this game as simple as possible, right? We're asking our guys to do things at an incredible rate of speed and be confident while doing it. So to me, that's the, the foundation of everything that I teach. How do we get guys to play fast and how do we get guys to play confident? Is there anything really more than that? Obviously, there's a hell of a lot that goes into that, but that should really be the ultimate goal. You want your guys to play faster and more confident. And if you can get that done, you're going to have a hell of a team, right? And you're going to get guys to buy in because it's a very confident group. That's how you win. That's how you consistently win. And it really all boils down to that. Get them to play fast and confident. They'll play together. They'll compete. They'll take care of each other. All that stuff really builds from that. I think the next thing that all coaches need to learn in really going to your players. Now, just a group of players. What do you need to learn? You got to know who they are, right? Easy in high school, you're around these kids a lot. Most of you, you're around these kids a lot, whether it's in school, um, in the weight room, different things like that. But really, deep down, knowing who they are. And I think from that, it's, it's what motivates kids and what scares them. Right? You have to know what is their motivation. Maybe it's playing at the next level. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's just having a great experience. Maybe it's just because they want to hang around with their buddies. But to me, you have to know what motivates a kid in order to have any chance to reach them, right? And then the second side of that is what scares a kid. What's going to hold them from success? What's going to hold them back? It's different for everybody. So once again, it kind of goes to getting you out of your comfort zone and taking that next step. You can't coach every kid the same way. I think that was the one thing that I learned from my dad at a very young age, just seeing how much you have to coach the individual. And then from that, you're coaching that group, but only that group for that period of time. And then it's got to change and develop and, and evolve. So those are two important things to me. The next thing that you have to learn about the individual is how they learn, right? Some people, it's got to be on the field, right? It's got to be in live type situations. A lot of young kids, that's the case because they haven't felt it. They don't know how to feel it. Some, some of them can get it on tape. Can you get it in a walkthrough? Whatever that may be. Maybe it's one-on-one -on -one situation on the field. 
Then you go to the meeting room. Does it have to be on tape? Can you get it to them on paper? You know, maybe it's whatever that may be. It's kind of thinking outside the box, but really understanding how kids learn. Most kids nowadays are visual learners. As you guys know, huddle, exos, all that type of stuff has changed the game. From when I was in college having the VHS, some of you guys were well before that, the real to real stuff, but the access to information is unbelievable right now. So you have to learn how these kids learn, and then you have to teach them how to use the information they have. Most kids have no clue. You gotta show them. Some of you guys have no clue because it's changed that much over time. So it's learning, right? I think Coach Rudolph did a great presentation on just over the years, right? How do you take some of the guys in your program, maybe some of the recent guys that you still have, how do you make them come to life? You show them, right? You don't talk about that all-American type of kid. You don't talk about the all-state kid. Can you show them? Some cases you can, some, some cases you can't. So very big to build a culture that way. How do your kids learn? You've got to find out. Everyone's different. You have to be willing to coach the individual. The next thing I want to hit on real quick, just leadership, right? Creating leadership. And I think this is a case where, honestly, the younger, I feel like, generally does it better, whether that's high school, going to college, the NFL think this is a little bit where they, where they miss the boat. First of all, the one, number one thing that they miss is reaching players at the personal level, even though it's a professional game, right? Everybody wants you to be a team player, but when all you talk about is your goals on the field, you're already above that as far as just people skills, right? Everything said, you don't care about me, right? You have to care about the kids first and then go to ball. You always got to come back to that relationship. Otherwise, why is this, uh, somebody going to trust you? Why are they going to think that you care about them? So jumping back a little bit. Now leadership, creating leadership. I heard uh, Scott Gaius, a good friend of mine, he kind of talked to me about, he's called it the rule of three. As a coach, kind of intimidating sometimes to try to lead an entire team, right? Very intimidating. Sometimes you got a lot of kids over a lot of classes, different maturity levels. How do you create a culture? How do you create leadership? The rule of three is, can you create three leaders? And then teach them to create three more, and create three more, right? You don't have to worry about leading your entire team, but you have to invest your time in your leaders. That's how a culture spreads. You know, very easy, Wisconsin, easy. I walked into a great situation. Ownership from our locker room, as far as who we are and what we are as a program, extremely high. Simple, how do you create that? In my opinion, this is a great way. You have to find your natural leaders and create them and develop them. You find a kid that's a young kid. I always hit my guys, there is no age limit, there's no height requirement, you don't have to reach a certain milestone to be a leader. If you do things the right way and treat people the right way, people will follow you. Simple as that. Obviously, you want to push your best players. If your best players are your best leaders, you got something special, right? Because you never have to say, yeah, I know he's really good and he doesn't work very hard, but you don't worry about that. You just, you have to do this, right? You, you get guys to totally buy into that concept. When your best players are your best leaders. But at that point, you have to get guys to own it. You have to get guys to own that culture. You have to get them to buy in. But you have to develop that core group of leaders and let everything spill out from there. You can't reach them all because they're not all ready at the same time. You may push a guy. I've been on a lot of teams where they're pushing a certain player. I'm going to put him in a leadership role to hope that maybe it'll help clear up some of the things that he's doing. Never works, never seen it work. Why? Because it just validated what that kid was about, right? He sees me as a leader, why would he change? So it's not trying to create leadership, false leadership. That's 
why I love all this stuff where you, your team votes, who's the leaders? All right, let's go there. That's who the people in the locker room want to follow. Develop them. And then you work from there, right? We're very fortunate right now. We'll do team votes. There may be two or three guys that are above, and then there's about 15 or 20 guys that are spread across. That's impressive to me because there's so many different guys that people want to follow. Easy to create a culture, easy to create leadership in that environment. Next thing, I kind of hit on it a little bit earlier, explaining why, right? Kids are smart, people are smart. You have to explain why. Why am I taking this step? Why do my eyes need to be here? And I think that goes back a little bit to having true understanding of what you're doing and what you're coaching. You gotta coach what you know, coach what you can explain, coach what you can get guys better at and so you can be consistent. If you can't explain why, it's probably not for you, right? Probably not for you. Met with a lot of coaches, went to different places this off season. You know, the number one piece of advice that I got was go to all these clinics, meet with coaches, was down at LSU, Oklahoma, um, Kentucky, Oregon, Hawaii, among about 10 other schools. You really go to something like that to find the people that are like-minded and do what you do, and then you go from there, right? How do you get better at what you do? There's a lot of amazing things that you hear as coaches at clinics. It ain't all for you because you can't coach it to that level to have success. So it's taking the coaching points, but really always taking everything back to why, 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 why. The answer is the way that this is just what we do, it's how we do it. You've done it for years, you should probably think it through a little bit more. Maybe it is the right way, but maybe it's not. So I think kids see through the bullshit, right? If you can't coach something well, it's hard for them to trust. So I always kind of fall back to that level. I always fall back to that level. The next thing that I want to hit on, just kind of core principles. Once again, culture. Everyone's trying to create a culture, a winning attitude, and buy-in from your team, getting ownership from your team. When we ask our guys, it's really a couple things. I mean, first of all, this is, this is your program. You gotta get your kids to buy in. The players gotta know it. It's gotta be who you are day in and day out. We ask our kids to be two things. We, once again, breaking it down as simple as possible. We're not big on all these slogans and catchphrases like a lot of programs. Do you love football? Or do you love being a football player and what that brings? If you love football, you're willing to be coached hard. You're willing to be coached hard. You wanna learn. You're gonna put in extra time. All that stuff. So number one thing in recruiting, Coach Chris asks, does the kid love football? If you can't find that answer out, we should not be recruiting him. Right? We will coach hard. We do not sell dreams to kids. You're going to work your ass off, we're going to develop you. That's our program. If you're not willing to do that on and off the field, best of luck. But number one, getting your kids to love football. High school is a little bit harder, right? Sometimes numbers, you're convincing kids. You know, they don't really want to be a football player, but you need numbers. That's hard, but it's trying to develop that culture, right? Then the next thing is whatever, whatever your core beliefs are, we, we always stick to three things. Smart, tough, dependable. Smart, tough, dependable. Smart. Everyone, you know, Wisconsin, high academic school. BS, right? IQ means nothing. Smart is are you smart enough to know how to get better? Are you smart enough to get better? Because that's when you realize sometimes you have the answers, you have the information, other times you've got to go out and find it. Right? You have to know how to ask for help. You've got to know when to go to coaches, when to go to your teammates. That's smart. It's more of that street smart, right? Which is what carries over to the football field. Got to have that. Do you know how to get better? Period. Tough, obviously. We, we know that. But sometimes a young kid Making a kid tougher as an O-lineman, does he hit the right landmark? Can he get square on somebody? Well, if he's always playing on an edge, you might think he's really soft, right? So toughness sometimes is just teaching the details and giving him an opportunity to be tough. Once he feels it, you got a chance. So a little bit of toughness goes back to teaching. Dependable. 
That one's easy. On and off the field. Can we count on you? Do your words and your actions match? That's it. Do you have integrity? Are you a man of integrity? That's it. That's the foundation of our culture. That's our program. Simple, right? So guys buy in. They own it. They understand when the guy to their left is or is not falling in line with what our culture is. So that's the non-negotiable, right? That is a non-negotiable. That's what your program has to do. Whatever that is for you, whatever you decide that is for your program, your kids have to push that. Obviously, there can be a million things that go along with that, but what's the core? Should be very easily to sit down with a kid and say, you're not smart right now. We gotta get you smarter. This is what I mean, and this is how we're gonna do it, and why. This is why we're gonna do it. The next aspect of this is, is goals, right? Everyone has goals. I think it's very important to know what your standards, what your goals are, and with your kids, they have to be a part of this process of setting them. Your core beliefs, they don't need to be a part of that. They need to buy in, right? If they're a part of that, great. But a lot of that has been set in your programs for years and years. But now the standards, maybe it's within a defense. Your standards within your individual unit, the DBs in my case. What your goals and standards are, that has to come from them. We just went through a huge process this offseason. Myself, Ash and Yabodi sat down, locked ourselves in a room for a long time. How are we going to get our kids to buy in and set goals and set the standards of this room? Ownership. Graduated a lot of kids the last two years. We got a bunch of babies right now on the back end. How do you get them to take ownership of that group, even though they don't have experience? So we went through a big process with them as far as on the field, off the field goals, academic goals. Had them fill out a bunch of information. We put it all together. This is everything you guys wrote. What are you guys as a group willing to put your name on, put your stamp on? And to me, the number one thing, it comes back to ownership. If it comes from them, they have to own it. They set the rules. They hold each other accountable. Coaches step in when needed. But if it's directed from them, you got a chance. All the great teams that I've been around, the players ran the team. The coaches mediated. They kept things within the lines. That's about it. Step in when you have to. I've been on a lot of good teams. Those were the great teams. A lot of good teams. Coaches directed it wasn't buy-in from the players. So you have to try to find and walk that line. You're dealing with a little bit younger kids, but you have to develop that, right? That's how you get kids to mature, is through ownership. So academically, once again, our guys, my DBs like to set the bar pretty damn low academically. I'm not going to lie to you. They, they like to walk that line pretty tight. But now we know. I know what to coach them to, right? I know what to coach them to. It's the same thing on the field. I can have a lot of goals. We can go off of what we've done in the past, but to me, the number one thing is that ownership, right? It's your group. It's your team. What do you want to be? What are your goals? And then really making that plan, helping them develop the plan on how to get there. What are the steps? What's the measurable stuff? What are the tools? All those tactics used to finally get to that, that goal. And we did it just for the spring. What do we want to be this spring? We'll recheck it after that. So, but the number one thing to me is the players has to be directed from them. Like I said, you're guiding them, you're helping them push them down the right path. Hopefully, over the last two years, those leaders in the room kind of know what we're looking for, right? You hope that's the case, but it has to be directed from them. They're going to lead it. In our case, we got to recruit the right kids that are going to take that. They're going to take that mentality, which goes a little bit to my recruiting speech. All these kids, I wouldn't be recruiting a kid if I don't think he's good enough. Right? So the talent level is there. The thing that I push with our guys is I believe, once I find out the right information where I'm willing to pull the trigger, I believe you can come into my room and change the culture for the good. You can change the culture. Talk that with the kid. Talk that with the parents. That's it. That's what I push. We're going to develop you. I'm going to make you a better leader. I'm going to make you a better person. Oh, yeah, by the way, you're going to be a damn good football player as well. But it all comes back from that. And it hits them on that personal level like I talked about before. 
Well, if they're messing up, their words and their actions are not matching, it all comes back to that conversation. Remember the first time we talked, this is what we talked about. I think you can make this program better. I think you can make the team and the locker room better. You're not doing that right now. You have gotta hit them on the personal level, right? In order to get the buy-in, in order to get kids to really believe in the culture, and in some cases when you don't have it, to create the culture. Does that make sense to you guys? Before I switch, I wanna ask a few questions just as far as this, it's kind of philosophy, what I believe in. Any questions on that before I kind of get into the DB presentation aspect of it? I'd like a couple, one or two. Yeah, so he, he asked kind of what coaches, you know, did some of the coaches I had really help develop this mindset? And absolutely. At least I kind of went back with my dad, was around that. He coached basketball and baseball, never coached a down of football in his life. So basketball and baseball. But to me, I learned from him just as far as the work, right? You're young. He was youth, high school, all that. Just once again, knowing the kids. You're helping kids grow up. You're helping them make decisions, um, things like that. Get to Wisconsin. Coach Alvarez was very big on teaching life through football. You know, very big on teaching guys how to be successful on the field, but obviously all those things that carry over to life. The majority of guys, the, the pads are coming off for everybody, right? So wanted to give them the things that would help them off the field as well. And a lot of that comes from the mindset aspect of it and the work ethic. I don't care what you do, that carries over. So got that from him. From Rex Ryan, Y'all jump a few coaches ahead, but Rex Ryan obviously is the personality. He was the one, he's di dyslexic, if you know that. So school, book smart, nope, not at all, as you guys can know when you hear him on TV sometimes. But he is all about relationships. So the thing that I took with him is about the relationship aspect and really getting the guys to own it. He needs a very, very, very strong locker room in order to be successful. I think at points in his career, he's forgot that. But every time he's had a strong locker room, great teams, great teams. So got a lot of the, the relationship, the personal aspect from that. Um, Mike Pettin, you guys all wanna know a little bit about Mike Pettin, all you Green Bay fans, love the guy to death. Very similar, that, that Rex Ryan background, Relationships are extremely important to him. He is much more calculated. He's much more analytical. If you see an interview, it looks about like this, right? You're not getting a whole lot out of him. He doesn't care what you hear. He has a ton of personality with the guys. He's right here. He's not gonna give anything to anybody unless he wants to. So you get him on a one-on-one -on -one situation, you get him in a team setting, that's it. It all clicks for those guys. He gets guys to buy in because he cares. And he pushes the ownership. He pushes the leadership aspect of it. Um, was awesome. I was down in New Orleans. Unfortunately, they cut me. Was that, wasn't there for a season, but was down there with Sean Payton. First offensive coach I had. I had Mike Malarkey as an offensive coach, then a whole string of defensive coaches. So just seeing the, the analytical side and you know, defensive guys, it's like, let's just go run into shit, right? Let's be physical and, and hit it. It's, Easy, easy game, right? Oh, your skill players don't really want to hear that. Let's be honest. They don't want to hear that. So to me, it was just seeing how you handle more of an offensive mindset, right? And the thing that I took from him was everything that he talked about in a team setting was how we win. Everybody prior to that point was, well, NFL average is if you get three turnovers, if you win the turnover battle, if you rush for more yards, if you do this, his was, this is how we win. Ever since I've been the head coach of the New Orleans Saints, if we do this, we win football games. Very personal, right, as far as who we are as a team and how we are going to be successful because this is what we believe in. Their big thing he talked about, if they created a turnover with Drew Brees, he was a quarterback the whole time, right? If they created a turnover, they won like 80% of the games. It was unbelievable. So obviously there's a lot of games they didn't. 
Well, why did they have Greg Williams as their coordinator? Because they were going to try to hurt people and take the ball away. Because if they got a turnover, they won. They're trying to steal a possession. That's it. Trying to steal possessions for that offense because they were going to score 30 plus. So that was big for me as far as learning, just diff totally different mindset. I came from the defensive side. It's like, we better hold them 17 or less, maybe 14 or less. I know the league average is like 23, 24. That ain't us. So a little different mindset just as far as how to play defense, right? Learned a lot from that. But it was nobody else matters. How do we win? What, what's our model going to be? thought that was very important. Very good question. Anything else? Oh, question is, when do I start looking for my leaders? Well, obviously, I get to recruit kids now. I'm looking for it there. Talking to coaches, talking to counselors. Who leads your team? You know, you talk to some of these big time programs, they're sending 12, 10, 12 guys to the to Division I level in a year. Who's the leader? Right? Who leads this group? You got three DBs. I went down to school in Georgia, they had three DBs that had probably 65 D1 offers. Who leads that group? That's who I want. Right? I'm going to spend my time into that guy. So, and then on your team, it's just finding out. I mean, that's being visual and seeing what's going on. Right? You got to see those guys and how they interact with each other. Who follows who? Who hangs out with who off the field? Gets back to knowing your players, right? Once you find out those, those alphas, right? Every group's got a handful of those guys that everyone, when shit goes wrong, they look here. Find that. You have to find that. It might be a kid, right? It might be a freshman. But when things go wrong, he rises up. Develop that kid, right? He can be the cornerstone of your program one day. You see that with the Badger basketball, right? That Davidson kid? I need to get a jersey. I fell in love with that kid. Why? He changed the culture of a team, right? You had a mass exodus of amazing players, right? And then you get a freshman come in. He goes, I know things aren't going well, but I'm going to will us through this. You know, obviously they came up short of where they wanted to get, but it didn't matter. He's early in the season, right? And all of a sudden you're like, who's that guy? And he ends the year the entire nation's talking about. And that's special. You got to cultivate that. You build around that kid. Doesn't matter how old he is, what his experience level is. So you really, you're looking all the time. That's just being a conscious observer of your team, of your locker room, the energy. You know, I've had guys on my team where I was like, the only thing I'll grade, I'm going to coach you technically, but I'm going to grade you off your energy. He's that kid that's always bouncing off the walls. He's getting juice for the whole entire group. Well, that day that he doesn't show up, I'm all over him because that's his personality. That's how he wins. That's how he makes us better. So it's, it's finding what roles, right? Not everyone's that you rah rah guy. Some guys, it's like, just, just wait. He's going to make a big play, and he's going to make a play early and set the tone. You let that happen. But there's other guys that got to take care of the rest of the group. You got to understand your group and what it needs. You're always finding those leaders. One more. Okay, he talked about, so you've got a really young kid that is that alpha on the field, just dominant, off the field making bad choices, parents enabling, all that type of thing. How do you deal with that? Very tricky, right? Very tricky, but to me that goes to the culture, right? Goes back to the culture a little bit. As a coach, you've got to sit down with that kid. Guess what? You are maybe our best player. You're one of our best players. If you can't be one of our best leaders, we're going to have issues as a program, as a team. Do you want to win, right? It's finding out what, motiv what, do you, what motivates you. You want to play at the next level? You can't do that shit. Can't do it. You want to be a state champion? Can't do that, right? We got to bring our teammates. They got to help you. Things like that. So it's, once again, that goes back to what, what motivates the kid and in a lot of cases, what scares the kid. That's it. That's what holds back a lot of guys. It holds back a lot of guys as far as what they're scared of, right? More and more players, more and more kids, single parent homes, right? 
Never really been yelled at by dad. Coach steps in, it's, it's understanding those situations, right? How do you, and I'm not saying you can't yell at that kid, but you have to understand where they're coming from on a personal level to, to, to reach them. So some of it, that, that is that, digging and finding out who that kid is and why. Why are we making these bad choices? Maybe it's not important to him yet. Maybe he doesn't realize how big this is and what it's gonna do to the rest of his team if he doesn't change. So to me, that, that goes back to just digging on the personal level and figuring out who that kid is. We'll go one more and then we'll kick it, uh, kick it to some DB stuff to get some of these old linemen out of here. One more over here. Nobody, right here in front. Yeah, yeah, he's talking about back to the goals and standards. Academically, so going through a lot of stuff. Well, Dean's List, well, is, your entire, is my entire DB group gonna be on the Dean's List? Probably not. You know, QM GPA over 3.0, 3 great goal. Some guys will get there, some guys won't. What are they gonna reach? Big thing that we do at UW, we reward guys for if their semester GPA is above what their QM is. Are you improving? Right, so it's, it's rewarding improvement. Some guys, the bar's pretty low, but it's trying to get them to understand like you're going the right direction. Now if you, if you follow through with it, can you continue to improve that way? So we hit that a lot with kids um, as far as what, what that looks like. Just going to class, right? Hitting your classes, hitting your tutors, all that stuff, you know, just the consistency, right? Consistency is a habit, you know? You have to work that. The guys that I find are very inconsistent on the field, usually very inconsistent in life, right? So it's getting guys to understand that that is a habit. It's important. You can get more consistent on the field just by doing stuff right throughout the day. So that's one of the things that I try to hit with our guys. How to handle adversity, teach a lot. How do you handle, it's gonna come. How do you handle it? Well, that goes back to a lot of the looking for help, right? Knowing, being smart enough to know how to improve yourself. So that's a lot of our academic stuff just is to deal with consistency, right? If they're consistently meeting with the right people, they're gonna create the right habits just off of that. But then improving, you know, just rewarding guys for improvement. On the field, it's a little easier to measure, right? You haven't success, success or you're not. You know, some of those things you can measure in the weight room, things like that, obviously, that comes a little quicker, but knowledge of the game, right? Just giving guys tests. We did a huge notebook for guys, just once again, how many different ways can we get them information? And then quizzing them, like, what do you know? Can you get on the board? Can you do this? Can you teach? Some guys can, some guys can't. But you see the light come on in some aspects. So that's a little bit more individual based on, on what you're trying to get out of them as far as the goals, but that's a lot of the kind of tricks I use with my guys. But wanted to switch over now to the football side. And like I said, I'm gonna talk really through my progression of off coverage and then go to press coverage. Not, a lot of you, some of you guys don't do that, so that'll kind of be last. If we get to it, we get to it. Otherwise, I can hit it when we break up. Some of you guys are DB guys. But off man, everyone's gonna play some sort of off man. Don't matter, what, cover one, cover three, Quarters coverage, well guess what? If number two is vertical on a safety, it's off man coverage. So that can all translate. We really want to teach as far as progression. How do you progress something? So I think that's really important. I thought the one thing that I always did as a player that was different than a lot of people was every year just going back to kind of core fundamentals as a player. You build up a lot of bad habits throughout the course of a year. You build up some compensations. Maybe my ankle was hurt. So you're, you're trying to make it through games and you're building up bad habits, right? So I always thought that smartest thing that I did with my body, with my mind, was always to go back to square one and start from there. That I think was one reason why I was able to overcome injuries a lot throughout my career. When you are forced to go back to square one and really reset your body. But that was a mindset I had no matter what. 
So I think I was able to always lock in and kind of start that process over. So I want to talk a little bit about that progression. How do you start from square one from somebody who has no idea on how to do something, teach them the positions that you're trying to get them to, and then just continue to get them better at that process. So you're going to hear a couple key buzzwords that I think are very important. And then you guys can apply that to your group, however you want to do that. But it doesn't matter the skill to me. It can be O-line, D-line, receivers, whatever it is. It's kind of the progression. Once again, dealing with DBs. It's all about speed, consistency, and confidence, right? So you're trying to teach these guys if you give them too much mentally, it's going to slow them down, right? It's going to slow them down. So it's always with that in mind, getting my guys to play as fast as possible, as confident as possible. If they can't go through the process quickly, you're hurting them. You're not helping them. So in, in the progression side of it, you, know, you may have kids that are only ready for the first two steps. You can't feed them anymore. All of a sudden, they're ready. You give them a little bit more. You give them a little bit more. Some of these things we're talking, we talked about challenge phase last year. We talked about top shoulder. Those are positions that we're going to talk a lot about tonight. We didn't talk about much else all last year with our DBs. Once again, from year one to year two, learning what my kids could handle as far as knowledge, what they could do physically, I learned a lot. Felt like I got a lot better as a coach understanding of how I have to tighten this up. NFL is very free, a lot of freedom. Once again, coaching the individuals, everyone's different. Hey, this is how you got to get it done, just do it. Well, learning how to structure that for college a little bit. Year one to year two, I thought I improved. Had great players both years. Year two, thought we got a little bit better. Year three now, this off season, and I'll show you more clips from this off season just to show you some of these young guys that I got and the consistency of how we're teaching it in, in the positions that they're able to get to. But it's getting them to buy in. You gotta buy in at the, the you know, ground one, floor one. So, wanna talk, is off man coverage, stance. Some guys are gonna go inside foot up, some guys are gonna go outside foot. Not trying to change any of that for you guys, but the number one thing for me as far as weight, where is my weight? If your first step's going backwards, your weight needs to be on your front foot. The majority of your weight. Guys get in trouble when their weight gets back, everything is on your heels, you immediately roll to your heels and stand up. So a lot of it that we're talking with our guys is you've got to stay on the balls of your feet. You've got to stay. If you roll onto your heels, your strides are too long. You're getting your weight too far back. That will help guys get low. Eye level. The lower your eyes are, the lower your body gets. If your eyes are high, a lot of times you raise up. So just those fundamental things. If, you're take, if your first step is backwards, your waist got to be on your front foot so you can push and keep your hips back and stay on the balls of your feet. Once again, if you're rolling onto your heels, your feet aren't moving fast enough. Everyone's tempo with their feet is going to be a little bit different. All I know is if you're on your heels, your feet aren't fast enough. So talking there, progression-wise, very important to know that you control the information, right? You control what's important. Your number one coaching point better be the first thing that you teach. I see a lot of coaches, they talk about all these amazing things. This is important, this is important, this is important. The number one thing better be the first thing you teach, right? Eye level, stance, body positions, all that stuff. If you jump in at step four, guess what? That's what the kid's gonna think is the most important. So all your drills, going back to that, what is the most important thing? That better be the first thing that you do. And your drills need to reflect exactly what you do. Went back a lot of stuff. DBs, a lot of back pedal, break, back pedal, break. All your different angles, all your different speeds, slow to quick to back pedal. Well, we've changed a little bit of the terminology. We talk about three things. We talk about our walkout, we talk about challenge phase, and then after that is either your breaking or you're crossing over to run. All of our drills have to reflect that. We have a set of drills for the first level. First level routes, quick game, right? Second level, that intermediate game, we're in our challenge phase. Third level, all the stuff down the field, the positions you gotta get to win. 
If you teach the positions, kids will get it. So number one thing is you own that, right? You own the information. You give it to them when they're ready for the next step. And once again, start at most important to least important. Buzzwords, to me, very, very good. Why? It's the speed. Play speed and confidence, right? You didn't get to top shoulder. Got to get to top shoulder. They should understand that and how they messed up. So it always comes back and it gets to that point of self-correction. How many plays, when a kid does good or bad, does he know it? Does a kid not know until the next day when he's watching tape? If you teach the game the right way, you get immediate self-correction after plays, right? They know I got long on my first step. Sometimes you can't feel it and you got to figure it out. But if you do it right, more and more plays, guys will be able to self-correct. Running back, my aiming point was shitty. All right, they know that they'll get better the next time you call outside zone, right? So you just got to teach what's important in the right order. So once again, now we'll go off man progression talking about our stance, talked about it, weight on the front foot, eyes, little different than a lot of people. Most people, it's waist level, right? Got to look at the belly button. We talk about in our off coverage, really from waist to knees, and even lower. Because what, everything breaks outside of that. Everything breaks outside of your body. This can stay straight. The better you are, give you troubles. You want your eyes low, but we are way lower than a lot of people coach. So our walkout, very comfortable. You'll see our guys very relaxed in their pedal. Why? Because from that, we transition to what we call challenge phase. When guys usually go, a lot of people talk slow pedal, faster pedal, then get out. We talk challenge phase. And you'll see there is a, a clear difference in what we do. As far as our footwork and challenge phase for us is we're changing our footwork, getting ready to open and break, and it lowers your shoulders. Very difficult for kids to stay down in a pedal for too long. So our walkout, this is how we transition. First drill we have. My bad. Once again, look how smooth that is. I'm walking, they may be going just a little bit faster than me. Once again, if your heels touch the ground, strides are too long, got to speed it up. You see their arms, doesn't look like anybody's running, right? We don't want to do that. If we're pedaling that fast, you should not be in a pedal anymore. So walk out, probably a little bit slow here, number four, young guy, Dante Burton, we're getting him right. But very, very comfortable, right? If we're transitioning to go faster, we transition to the next, next phase of it. Just different breaks out of that. Well, if we're in our walkout, these are the only break angles we're going to get. We're going to get zero, coming straight back down, hitches, stuff like that. We're going to get slants. We're going to get outs. If we transition past that point, we're not going to be in our walkout very much longer. So just working the drills that you're going to get out of those positions. Watch the guy in the middle. Great, nice, clean, tight breaks. Once again, you see the arms nice and smooth. Getting down, he could not do this in January very consistently. He worked his ass off, got better. Sticking your opposite foot. Everyone, we, we teach T-step. A lot of you guys running in, running out, we teach T-steps. Why take two steps when you can get out in one? But you got to teach guys how to be powerful laterally. So we do a lot of work, extra work, to teach guys how to play lateral, how to stick their foot in the ground. So guess what? Out of our walkout, that's about all we work on, because that's all we're going to do. Challenge phase is the next aspect. Once again, there is a distinct change in how we transition our feet, and it's also kind of a reminder, sh shoulders got to get lower. We got to get ready to break. Challenge phase. You see their walkout, right? Walkout, watch the distinct change with his, with his feet. Challenge, kind of opens his hips a little bit. You want him pointing at the receiver. He's trying to get to the position, what we call right here is top shoulder. If a person has to run a go route through you, you're top shoulder. So walk out, challenge phase, top shoulder. You'll watch over here, he gets to that same exact position just a little bit later 
because he does a really, really good job of gaining depth in his challenge phase. It's matching the receiver's angles and getting to these certain positions. Once again, bigger group, you'll see all of them pretty consistent. I would say he turns his, his hips just a little bit too early. These guys, maybe a little too square here. That's about perfect by number two, a little bit too square. But you see where they're working to. They're working to that top shoulder position of, can I cover the go with my body? They got to gain a little bit more ground in their walkout, just like number 20 did a clip ago. But we'll get there, work on it a lot. He's probably the best. He really got this last year, never played a snap. This is Fayon Hicks, kid out of Florida, red-shirted. He had uh, shoulder surgery a year ago, so we missed the year. Really, really smooth athlete. He is a glider. Pretty fun to coach. See the positions he's getting to. All right, just teaching these guys as far as breaks. First level breaks, we're going to be in our walkout. Second level breaks, we're going to be in that challenge phase position. Third level, we're crossing over and running, having to sink our weight and transition from there. Let's watch these young guys here. Reggie Pearson, mid-year enrollee. Deron Harrell was a receiver we just flipped. Very, very good feet. You just watch at 19, how explosive his feet are. That's our walkout break. All right, we're going to teach this second level break. Challenge phase, same break. One, two, three. Now a third level break. This is really good here. Now they get into a crossover run. Much harder for guys to be consistent. That's why we transition to this challenge phase. We talk about it a ton. Much easier to get out of those breaks. You're in controlled positions. If you got to cross over and run, it's hard. Very hard for guys to sink their weight. It was a good job here. Watch 21 here. Walk out. Very easy to get clean breaks. Challenge phase, the next step. Second level. Challenge, bam, get out the break. Then this one, you'll see a lot of variation on it because it's harder to do. Third level, crossover run, sink your weight. Once again, you see, very clean, pretty good. Ah, you start getting a little loose up here. Harder to get out of those breaks. Once again, skill progression. Now taking it to the field, right? This would be a level two break out of our challenge phase. Walk out, challenge, get out the break, right? Walk out, challenge, he's directly on top of this guy. If he's gonna run a go, gotta run it right through him. Get out the break. Caesar Williams, another young guy. Could not do that a year ago. Watch this right here. Walk out, challenge, straight down the stem. That's our drill, right? That's second level, zero degree break. Second level, 45. Once again, watch these young guys. Walk out, challenge. Get out. Power, right? He's not being nice. He is not being nice with his feet. Stick your feet in the ground. 89, great flexibility. Bam, stick your foot in the ground. That's different. Once again, Caesar Williams. Let's take a look at it. Walk out, challenge. Let's see it better from this angle, sorry. Walk out, challenge. Where is he running? He's running to get top shoulder. Meaning if he continues on a go, he's got to run it through you. If you cover the go, you can get really aggressive to play the ball. You can get really aggressive to break downhill. He can't run a go right now. Get out the break. It's a great job. Different angles. Well, sometimes you're going to challenge to the right, and they're going to break to the right. Sometimes you're going to challenge to the right, they're going to break to the left. Got to work all that stuff. He's figured it out. In his challenge phase, he maintains about two to three yards. Can have great vision. Where do we want our vision? It's belly button, right? Hell no. From waist to knees, low. They sink, we sink. Can you be lower than them on the break? So all the different angles. Challenge to the right, break to the left. Challenge to the right, break to the right. Got to work on all those as a DB. A lot of variables on where we can be. 90 degree breaks. Once again, 19, young, young pup. Been here for six practices. You just see the violence of his feet. Pretty impressive, I love that kid. 
Same thing. But this is the transition point of walk out to challenge rather than slow to quick. Most DBs, it's slow to quick. We're going slow to challenge. We're bringing our hips down. We're getting in a position where it's a little bit easier to turn, a little bit easier for to get us to get in that challenge top shoulder position. That's all we're worried about. These are all the coaching points I'm talking. Walk out, challenge, break. Easy to be consistent, right? Walk out, challenge, break. See your shoulders? All down, easy to break. Level two, work in the post. So we don't play with a whole lot of leverage, right? I think that to be a little bit different than what some of you guys do. We want to be either really tight. If we're off a guy's body, down the field, we want to transition to where we're a little bit more head up. What gets coaches fired? Deep balls, right? If I'm a DB coach and the ball's going over our players' heads, Coach Chris will fire me. Simple as that. So taking away the go, in some cases with your body, we're not, we want to be aggressive as much as possible, but still take away what we need to take care of, right? That's the goal. So you see him. Can he run a go without going through his body? No. Easy for him to get to the top. Same thing. You see that just slight drift at the top, right? How do I get right on top of this guy? Take care of the go. Easy to get to the top. Once again, glider, Dade County can't catch, though. So. We'll work on that. He did have two interceptions today for you guys at practice. Escort, another one of our buzzwords. So we talked right now, straight releases. Walk out, challenge phase. Well, what happens if I'm leveraged on a guy and he pushes to cross my face? Most people, what do we got to do? We got to maintain our leverage, right? We got to weave, got to weave, got to weave, got to weave. We want to maintain our leverage, use our post player. We teach this instead, escort, teaching our escort. So right now, they are leveraged over here. So leverage that way, receiver here. Actually, ah, there we go, switch the leverage up. So this guy is going to get all the way across. What's the first thing we're going to do? Walk out. We're going to get to challenge phase. If a guy's stemming you, you better be in your walkout through the stem. Better be in the walkout through the stem. So walk out. Now he's outside of him, right? He went from inside of him to outside of him, or outside to inside, whatever you want to think of, however you want to think. This is now when we get into the position we call escort. We want to escort this guy off of his line, whatever that is. We want to be top shoulder. We are escorting you where we want you to go, not where you want to go. Where do they end up? Top shoulder. Top shoulder. Top shoulder, right? That's where we want to get to. But we don't weave, we escort. We're going to change our leverage if we need to be. Rather than opening lateral space for a quarterback, then we're going to get into that escort position, which ends up with us being top shoulders. Walk out, challenge phase, escort him off his line, get to top shoulder. I would say he's about a step away from where he wants to be. How we transition this to ball drills down the field. Lean and locate from escort. He's outside leverage on this guy. He's going to walk out. He's going to get to challenge. Where is he? He's top shoulder. Take care of the go. Guess what? Go play the football. Everyone, all you guys, yell at your TV. Why, why can't he get his head around? Why can't he get his head around? They're usually not top shoulder. Whether it's from press, whether it's from off, when you're worried about the go, you can't look for the ball because you're going, oh shit, I'm going to get my coach fired or themselves fired in the NFL. So when you get to these positions, you can be ultra aggressive to break or to play the football because if he continues down the field, he's got to go through you. Madison Cohn, another young guy, figuring out football right now, doing things he couldn't do a year ago. Once again, walk out, challenge. I don't think he really is an escort because I think he's inside leverage. So he's going to challenge, he's going to get to top shoulder, then he's going to be aggressive and go play the ball. Level three stuff. So once again, you got to work. Walkout breaks, challenge breaks. Level three, harder. We don't want to work on this as much as the other two.
because we want to avoid this as much as possible. But it's going to happen. Walk out, challenge, watch 89 right here. Walk out, challenge, cross over, get out the break. Can you situate? He's got a special gift to do that, was not given to him by mom and dad. Somebody bigger than that gave it to him. Walk out, challenge, cross over, sit your way. See his eyes? Real low, right? Really, really low. Get out the break. He had 21 picks in high school. I messed him up. Now we can't catch. All right. Any questions as far as our off man stuff? Coach, what's your landmark for each of these different trades? Say two, three, four, two, three yards off. Here's a little bit alignment wise. We talk about eight yards off as far as our off man corners. Transitionist to quarter safety is probably going to be a line somewhere between 10 and 12. Guess what? Your walkout's just longer. So it's not really a spot on the field as much as if you get guys to pedal, have somebody run at them full speed. When they're pedaling, in order to stay in a pedal, if they have to go faster, that's it. That's when you want to transition to that challenge phase. So that's kind of how we teach it right away. You're in your nice smooth pedal. If in order to go faster to keep up with him, that's when you want to get to challenge. A couple yards on top, say you see down the field, we're still two, three yards on top when we're in that challenge phase at the top, a lot of those comebacks and digs and things like that. So just kind of have them feel it. Go ahead. You got to get better players, man. That's, that's how you worry about matchups. No, obviously, if you're playing a lot of man coverage, you got matchups, that's the name of the game. So you got to give your guys chances to succeed. Right? We're pretty evenly matched and hopefully in some cases better than the guys we're playing against. Right? So obviously you have to play to your talent level and who they're going across from. That's why I can't tell you, hey, you're going to get to challenge phase at seven yards. It's different for every guy. Why? Because you're different and he's different. Guy running at you fast, you're going to have to get to challenge and you may have to open up faster. So that's why it's, it's very individual. Just wanted you guys to see the positions. You guys can learn walk out, challenge, top shoulder, right? If you can get to those positions just off of this talk, you'll have a lot of success as DBs. We'll go fast here, a little bit of the press stuff. Once again, you guys don't, some of you guys don't do it, so don't want to spend a whole lot of time. We work a lot of lateral drills, lateral power, lateral explosion. It's getting in and out of breaks. Translates very easily to our press man stuff. We're not, some guys are going to back up what we call a mirror technique. Some guys are going to sit in the paint, play what we call read react, step replace, a lot of different names for it. So, but it all comes to us from lateral movement, bringing our hands and feet. So we do some band drills as far as training our guys to get power. So you'll see, you can kind of see on here he's got bands on. We play a little bit more head up. We also play with a little more space than a lot of people. Where do we think we want, we want our eyes to be? Waist to the knees. If you get too close, guess what? You can't see that. So our guys are a little bit deeper. We're starting them all about two yards. We can transition them to about a yard and a half if they get really good and trust it. About two yards off. You see the lateral movement. Step replace. That's why this is called step replace. Right here is a drill. They're not using their hands. They just want resistance on the band, nice and quick. Left foot, get that second foot down. We are looking waist to knees. See that break right there? We call it the V. When can you see the V? When those knees split, that's when we want to react laterally to it. If you don't get it, that space closes, that's when you got to use your hands. Everyone asks, what comes first, your hands or your feet? All depends on the release you get. If he attacks you vertically and you feel that space closing, got to shoot your hands. As Soon as you see that V, doesn't matter what your technique is, you got to bring your hands and your feet. So this one, no hands. Go here. Step replace. Now you're adding the hands to it. See how quick it is? Thumbs up punch. We want to get right on that breastplate. So that's where we start out. Once again, I'm going to go quick through this stuff. But you see, step replace. That's where we want to start with our guys. Two yards, step replace. Then 
The only thing that we're worried about is if a guy gets outside of your frame, thinking's over. Step replaced, bring your hands, bring your feet. So your whole plan is predicated on what you want to do if a guy attacks you vertically. Because if he gets outside of your frame, thinking's over. It's all done. Bring your feet and your hands. So we're working a lot of outside release stuff right now. A little bit different. Watch 31. Hands and feet. 21. Hands and feet. They get outside of your frame. There's no more thinking. Hands and feet. How does it transition to the field? Let's see. We want to get to this clip. Hopefully it zooms in here. No. Big jump. Watch up top. Hands and feet. Guess what position he's in right now? Top shoulder. Top shoulder. Escort. Put him out the door here if you can. That's what we're worried about. Top shoulder. How do we get there? If you get beat early, you got to take the right angle to get there. That's all that matters. Sticking on me. Here we go. No, not what we're worried about. We'll work on it, John. Go to the next one. That's the last clip. So, like I said, didn't want to spend a whole lot of time on our press coverage, but once again, we play more head up rather than leverage. We play a little bit deeper than a lot of people because of what we want to see, where we want our eyes. If a kid gets inside of two yards, you know what has to happen? His hands and feet got to go right now. You're not reacting anymore. You're taking the game to them. So your hands and feet got to be faster. A lot of guys struggle with that. Go ahead, a couple questions. He asked about run support from off or press. I think definitely in off, you get better, right? Easy to run guys off in press. It's hard for those guys to get off. Crack or place, some of that situation. So you got to be smart as far as when you press, when you're off. We want guys to be aggressive. If, if we're controlling guys and getting a top shoulder, it's hard for them to crack. So we're OK in a lot of situations pressing. But vision-wise, you know, a lot of teams run in option. A lot of teams run in zone read. Vision-wise, yeah, off in a lot of cases is a little bit better because they can see the quarterback. I mean, a lot of teams playing true thirds where their eyes on the quarterback, things like that, obviously you're going to be off or bail, stuff like that. A couple questions, and I'll lead, get, lead this over to Coach Chris. That's who you really want to talk to. We work all that off-man that off progression that we went through it's every day. If you went to practice today, you saw it, or at least aspects of it. We had about 15 minutes of individual. We spent 10 minutes doing that. We split up. I talked to the safeties. The corners did five minutes of this press work. A lot of times, we're trying to steal that band work pre-practice, post-practice. It's a lot of muscle activation, right, all you strength coaches? All it is is muscle activation. Then you take the bands off, just like baseball, man. Take the weighted bat. Take the weighted bat off, your feet should move a little faster. So that's all we're trying to do with a lot of this stuff. But it's teaching them those positions. Can you get to top shoulder from press? If you're in a winning position with your hands, you're top shoulder early. If not, you've got to take the right angle to get there. And then it becomes a quickness game. Once you're to the top, it becomes a quickness game and the test of eyes. If you've got great eyes, you're going to be in a great spot. We don't get beat. What are you talking about? Get beat. Obviously, you've got to work those bad positions. You are not allowed to look for the ball if you're beat. So you have to work on stuff where they're playing the pocket, right? You're playing the pocket. You're, you're running your ass off. We always talk about run early or run late. You know, a lot of guys, they, they'll be in a decent position, but they're kind of coasting early. Guess what? You're going to be running late in the down. So we work a lot of those positions. Yeah, absolutely. You've got to work on drills where they're playing the pocket. All of a sudden, they're late. You know, a lot of penalties come from underthrown balls, right? Well, why? Because the guy got beat, ball's underthrown, you can't look back, you're not in a position to have success, all that stuff. So absolutely, you got to work from those bad positions. Got to work from those bad positions down the field. Once again, deep balls get you cut. Deep balls get you fired. So you got to work on 
good positions and bad positions to get there. We'll, we'll do that a decent amount. Any more? Go ahead. Yes. Everything right, when your top shoulder, when you've taken the go away with your body, once again, early in the down, you gotta be patient, right? You gotta kinda clear it and feel, you know, when can he not sit, right? If you're getting there early, which is what you want, there's a little bit of timing aspect to it. But down the field, once you get there, you can be really aggressive to the football. Once again, he's running the go through you. He's running the posts, and you're directly on top of that thing. You dig, all that stuff. That's when you can get ultra aggressive. Get out of your break and you can go find the ball because you're, you're exactly in the positions you want to be. Is there a point where you can you The question was, is there a point where you're beat, you take a penalty? Absolutely. Absolutely. You got to do what you get. Double moves it happens a lot, right? Guy breaks on a double moves, maybe gets his eyes to the quarterback too fast. That's all he's got, right? You have to. Down the field, college football, 15 yard penalty, right? It's not NFL. They're talking about getting away with it. Why? Because it's turned into a whole lot of, we're going to take 10 shots down the field because we're going to get two of them that go for 60. That hurts, right? So yeah, there is definitely an aspect of, if it's all you got left, Sometimes you got to take it, right? We're trying to avoid those as much as possible, but it's going to happen. You're a press corner, you get downfield and you start to stumble, trip. Do what you got to do, right? Do what you got to do. We're finding out NFL or NCAA football, they, they don't like to call PI away from the throat. Sometimes you take it if you get in bad position. You don't want to, but sometimes you have to do it. A lot of questions from the front and smart guys in the front of them, nothing from the back walking in from the bar. Yeah, he asked about speed turn. Asked about speed turn, absolutely. It's all off your hip. If your hips are in the right spot, meaning they're gonna be pointed at the receiver, you should be able to come underneath and make that transition. But sometimes your hips, receiver's here, your hips are downfield. If he cuts what we call into our blind spot, you got to get out of it the best way possible. So absolutely, if you got a speed turn, you have to speed turn. You're trying to avoid those situations, right? You're trying to put them in positions that you avoid it. A lot of times that happens with bad hand placement or a bad angle on your initial break. You're going too far in front. But if you got to get out of it that way, you have to get out of it. So absolutely, we, we would teach that down the field. Copy of those drills. Yes, I can get those to some of you guys. Yes, absolutely. It's not rocket science. That's the biggest thing to me. It's not, we're not recreating the wheel. We're not doing anything totally different. But to me, it's, it's getting your kids, once again, play fast, play confident. Very first thing I talked about. How do you get them to play fast and confident? It's the consistency in what you talk about. It's consistency in the positions you're asking them to get there, right? Once again, if you're struggling first level routes, well, these are the drills you need to do to get better. The next level, these are the drills you need. It's putting a plan together, going through that process and giving them that individual plan. He, he asked if we chart kind of at what level these breaks are happening for certain guys. Um, we, maybe we should, maybe you're onto something. Um, we don't necessarily do it, but obviously we watch a lot of tape. We know the aspects of the route where we want you to be, certain positions, right? So we know the routes that they're seeing and the positions that they're in, so really it's all the crossover stuff. If you can eliminate a crossover, if you can eliminate a guy from being in too fast of a pedal, that's where that challenge phase really comes into play for us. You're going to get consistency in the breaks. So we haven't necessarily charted it, but we do ask our guys to be conscious of where they're getting beat. Right? Obviously, we're watching it. We kind of know, but we want our guys, once again, to take the ownership of it. Right? I'm struggling here. What can I do to get better? Come on, son. I got gotcha. you. Let's go watch some tape. These are two drills that can get you better. Right? A lot of what we see is eye placement. 
their eyes are in good spots, they're getting to these spots, they might not even know why. But if your eyes are in the right spot, it's going to help out a ton. I think they're cutting me off. Coach Chris is fired up right now. So I appreciate it, guys. Great questions. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you.